We've got something new for you in this episode. It's our inaugural monthly suburb trends report, and we're here to help you make sense of what's happening in various property markets across the country right now. We'll be looking at where prices are moving, either up or down, and why they're moving. In order to do so, we're using a metric that's not commonly used in Australia, but one that makes a hell of a lot of sense. We're not looking at actual prices. Instead, we're looking at two crucial lead indicators for price movement. At the moment, I'm counting just over, well, nearly 80 listings at the moment on average, so about 78 listings. Um, and then you look at, well, how many properties are selling uh, on average? Uh, and when I look at that, there's around six, give or take, six properties selling per month. Wow. So, you know, that tells me that the inventory levels are, you know, significantly higher than, than 12 months. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a conflict in the data saying that uh, prices are going up if you use median prices as your guide. Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. You've heard us say it many times, despite what the headlines may suggest in times of boom and bust, Australia is not one big property market. It's made up of thousands of micro markets. These monthly reports will really demonstrate the diversity of market behaviour across this vast land. To do this right, we've partnered with Property Data Nerd, and I mean that with the greatest respect, Kent Lardner, who is a founder of Suburb Trends. We've had discussions with Kent before back in episode 6 and 71. Go back and listen if you haven't. They're foundational for understanding property data. Kent, can you please introduce yourself for those who haven't heard those episodes? Hello, Veronica and Chris. How are you going? Um, I, I'm a bit of a data geek, as you know. Um, I help businesses with um, data and analytics and research problems, and uh, I help individuals do their property research through my website, suburbtrends.com. Kent, I've been looking forward to this. There's so much data out there. It's very easy to get completely overwhelmed with you know, what to listen to. On the other hand, you can kind of oversimplify the data, um, like top 10 lists and all that clickbait that you see out there. So Kent, can you share us the methodology you use when assessing the performance of different areas and what's really happening? Yeah, I, uh, I keep things fairly simple. Um, I carve up the market into actually around 500 markets. Um, I use something called a statistical area level three. Um, it's a, an Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, area. Um, there's, uh, give or take, there's about 350 of those around the country. What I typically do is I carve it up and say that's a housing market per SA3 and that's a, a unit market per SA3. And when I tally that up, there's about 173 unit markets around the country because some of them, some of these regions just really don't have any units. So it's not, not big enough to be called a market. Um, so in total, I've got 173 unit markets, 324 housing markets. And so when you tally those up, it's around 500 markets that I analyze. Mm. What I typically then do is I focus on two key metrics. The first metric for houses for sale or the, the sale market, I look at something called inventory. This is widely used in the US and even in New Zealand, they're using it. But in Australia, it's been a little bit slow to take off. I'm not sure why. But inventory tells us, is the market overstocked or understocked? Is it a buyer's market or a seller's market based on how many months of inventory? The other, yeah. the other key metric I use is for the rental market, which is pretty simple. It's a, how many listings are there? 21 days or older. So that's a, a, an input into something called vacancy rates. But I like to actually break it down and focus on the count of listings over 21 days because it's a little bit easier to understand. Mm. So I guess with the inventory, you're saying the average, averaging out how many sales are done per month and yeah. then saying, look, there's enough properties to on the market, even if there was no new listings, the current stock would take X amount of months to kind of get rid of, I guess. Yeah. So in theory, if no new listings came on and you had 100 listings yep. currently and 10 were selling per month, 100 divided by 10, it would take 10 months to clear out the shelves, to clear out that inventory. 
So that's the that's the theory, the measurement of, of inventory. Um, and, and the great thing about it is it does capture both supply and demand in a single metric. And I'm curious, Kent, why not suburb level? Why SA3 level? Mm. Well, I do, I do go down to the suburb level, absolutely. But um, with a lot of suburb level metrics, I, I actually call out a lot of caution with regards to suburb metrics because they're volatile. So month to month, if you've got any metric, doesn't matter what it is, if that bounces around, it's high and low and high and low, that volatility tells me there's something wrong with the sample size or the sample distribution pertaining to that suburb. When you break it out to these SA3 levels, it's the Goldilocks uh, measurement because it's a lot smoother. So I start with the SA3. I start with that regional metric, and then I determine whether the region is a buyer's market, seller's market, or balanced market. Then I drill down to the suburbs, and that's what we're doing here each month. The volatility side of things, that's sort of driven by both listings and transactions, right? Generally, the sales volume stay fairly consistent. So yeah, right. your, your, your volatility doesn't necessarily, because what you can do with it with sales volumes is you can average that out using a rolling 12-month average. So by and large, using 12-month rolling averages is a common approach to dealing with some of those volatility or sample size problems you have at a suburb level. But even doing that still gives you problems with a lot of metrics, including days on market, including listings volumes. So there can be some challenges at a suburb level, specifically when you get down to small numbers. I like that because what you're saying is that if there is 100 properties, it is going to take you know 10 months to kind of get rid of that stock. But it might be you know, a lot of it goes in the next, say, three months, and then it really dies off for over the next seven months because you're averaging it. Is that kind of right in the thinking that even if there is rises in the spring and the, you know, the autumn sort of property markets, averaging it out, that, this, that kind of allows it to still be relevant? It does smooth things out. So that you know, that's always the trade-off. Um, mm. So, that, you know, they, and especially if you look at Melbourne, you know, it's very seasonal. And mm. not much happens around the AFL Grand Final. We all know that. Uh, but but generally, as long as you understand what you're doing, I think you've got to be able to talk to how you're manipulating and or processing the data, talk to the limitations of the data. What yeah. you've got with a rolling 12-month average is a problem that sometimes if things are happening, um, there's a little bit of a lag effect uh, because you, you, you're looking in the rearview mirror. But for the seasonality, you've got, you've got an AFL in every single... Um data point, right? Because you've got 12 months of data and every time you're looking at it. Um, but what about the thing that everyone's been complaining about lately is a lack of stock. And over, certainly since 2016 in Sydney, anyway, we've noticed a definite lack of stock. And when you look at those transactional, um, the bar graphs, for instance, that show um, one that I love on your website actually is is the uh, the price segmentation price segments, yes. graph. You know, that's one of my favourite charts. Yeah. Um, and when you look at those over time, you can definitely see volumes of transactions have fallen. And it is hard to separate that transaction from um, listings at times because, you know, there could be a lot of listings on the market, but as you say, there's still a level that are transacting. But what we can see is that there have been a fall in listings over the last few years and a fall in transactions that follow that, how do you pull that apart so that we can make sense of that and so it's it's not cat and mouse or chicken and egg? Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, look, there's a positive and a negative to this. Uh, The the positive of of reduced listings volumes is that it's it's kept the market in balance. So there's a lot of markets that are still considered seller's market purely on that ratio of inventory. Mm. So, you know, yes, sales volumes have fallen down, but so have listings volumes. Therefore, the market isn't going to plunge in terms of prices when you consider that there's not a high level of inventory. So that's the beauty of the inventory metric. Yeah. It captures yeah. both supply and demand. So I think, but one of the, you know, what Veronica, what you covered there was that the market had already um, slowed down a lot. There was very, very few listings in so many suburbs um, mm. pre-COVID. Um, and 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 post COVID, we're finding that that's probably accelerated a little bit further. We've got what very few listings in many markets. Having said that, sales volumes have dropped down. And then when I look at it at an SA three market across my five hundred markets, I would argue that 
the unit market's the one that's most interesting because sales volumes or listings volumes are still high and, mm. and sales volumes are low for a lot of areas. So I would argue that around 41% of the SA3 regions that I, that I analyze, 41% would be considered buyer's markets for units at the moment and about 17% are buyer's markets for housing markets and most of those are in regional areas. So how many are buyer's markets for houses? For houses, only 17%. 17. My, uh, yeah, seven, 17%. 56 out of 324 markets that I review um, would be considered buyer's markets. And the bulk of those are in regional areas, not your capital cities. Very interesting. Now, you know how much we balk at the idea of chasing hotspots. Kent, you've come up with some cold spots we should definitely be steering clear of. And I guess that's what we've just been touching on. So you're here to help us understand what's causing them and the signs we can look for when assessing other areas. But let's talk about, about the cold spots. Let's talk about, you know, those regional areas and also, you know, the, the unit uh, areas that we need to be really worried about. Yeah, I wouldn't say steer clear as much as I, I, what I do more than anything, I just talk to the data. And then, you know, yeah, how people want to behave and use that data is entirely up to them. So I don't say steer clear or not because I don't want oh, to be don't met. Worry. I will. I don't <laughs> want to be met in a dark lane by a real estate agent that's unhappy with me. Um, but uh, so w- what I what I typically do is I look at the the SA three regions. That's our first thing, um, mm-hmm. and I've identified um, I identify three areas um, or three regions in the housing market, and three regions in the housing market that are hot and three that are cold at the moment. And the metrics that I use are both inventory and the change in inventory. And then I drill down to a representative suburb. So if you like, I could I could talk about some of those locations right now. Let's do that. Okay. So um, the, the three areas that I would consider cooling, um, uh, the region is called Rouse Hill, McGrath's Hill, um, and that's in the Sydney, Borkham, Hills, Hills, Hawkesbury area. The inventory level for houses there at the moment <clears throat> is very close to 11 months right now. Wow. And that's increased just month on month. That's increased by nearly one month's worth of inventory uh, in, in the last month. So things, um, things are cooling significantly in that, in that region, in that pocket, that uh, SA3 area. The second area is also in New South Wales. That's Armidale. That's up in that New England northwest area. That's close to 10 months of inventory. Uh, and that's nudged up a little bit higher again in the last month as well by a few weeks of stock. And then the third area in the housing market is Bow Desert. Now, it's um, up in southeast Queensland in that Logan Bow Desert area. That's sitting just over nine months of inventory, and that's got that's risen by a few weeks of, of, of inventory as well in, in the last month. So there's three areas that are cooling that at a regional level, and we'll talk about select suburbs in a moment. I'll go on to, and I'll talk about the three areas that are actually warming. Um, we've got Warringah down in, in Sydney and the northern beaches there. Um, that's very low, and it has been low for a long time. It's down, you know, d- down around 1.4 months of stock. So not much happening to your point earlier, Veronica. There's not a lot of listings. Mm. The, sec- the second area is Belconnen down in the ACT, just over a month. So it's been that whole ACT has been a, a thriving hot market for so- quite some time. Just on that, we're actually got a buyer's agent from the ACT we've got lined up to be interviewed and we'll be bringing that out because a lot of people have been asking us about um, Canberra in particular it's got its own dynamics going on down there hasn't it I mean this not responding to COVID the way everywhere everybody else is well it's the it's the jobs market and obviously you've got a lot of uh, the public servants down there the median income the household income very high very high Um, What we're waiting on at the moment is the release of the small area labour market data. That could come out any week now. I think this recording is obviously in the first, what's the date today? I'm trying to look at it. 8th of July. July. So um, it could could come out in the next week or two, the small area labour market. That's going to be a big focus of mine, looking at how uh, certain industries, so there's about 19 different job categories that they publish down to the SA2 level. And then I aggregate that up and build my SA3 models that I, you know, I love my SA3s. Um, <laughs> and and you, can, you can pretty much guarantee that the ACT will stay strong in terms of unemployment. And we'll, I guess the other side of the camera, which we will chat on another podcast with this buyer's agent that's coming on, 
Um, but there, this is the housing we're talking about here. We're not talking about units. And, you know, from going down to Canberra last year, um, there's a lot of new units getting built down there. So you've got, this is, you know, the benefits of these this podcast and what we're talking about today is showing the different markets performing different ways. And, you know, you've got dramatically differences between, say, Rouse Hill here and, you know, Bellican and in the ACT. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And what I just want to add in too, Kent, that um, that data you're waiting on, we will be able to report on in August, in our August monthly update, right? You can. I'll be publishing the magazine based all around that as a theme. One last one last <laughs> area, one last SA3, and it's one of your favourite areas. It's the marrickville Sydenham. Petersham SA3, which is around yep. Sydney, the inner south areas in the city. So it's down, it's just you know, one one month of stock, so not much at all. So picture that, you know, nothing else came came on the market, you'd have nothing left in four weeks' time to buy. What you're also showing is that, that you know, the amount of buyers that are actually transacting this month, let's say it's 10, um, there's only 10 properties. So if, if there was 20 buyers looking to buy this month, and there's only 10 properties, you've already got two buyers for every property. Um, whereas comparing that to say somewhere like, you know, the Logan area, which is a lot of house and land packages, um, Rouse Hill is surrounded by areas of house and land packages. Yeah. You know, there's 10 months of stock there already for the amount of buyers on the market. So, you know, there's every property, that well, there's not even a buyer, there's, you know, one-tenth of a buyer, let's call it, um, available on it so very few buyers lots of properties yeah and 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 this is what drives prices and 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 it's a a big call out for me is and and i'll I'll focus on the rental market for just a moment is usually the rental market is a lot more dynamic and moves a lot faster but even in that market prices just don't seem to be moving enough to attract buyers in sufficient numbers so the market's not clearing we're not getting back and i'm I have to use the term equilibrium because of high school economics, but these markets kind of get back into that equilibrium mark around six or seven months, maybe up to eight months. So typically six or seven months is is, is what you could consider equilibrium where there's not an excessive pressure upwards or downwards on price. But as soon as you get above that eight month mark of inventory, there's a fairly significant pressure, downward pressure on price. Having said that, mm. a lot of the new new estates, a lot of the new build units don't seem to be moving prices significantly. So that's why I think they stay in disequilibrium for so long because the builders, the new builders, they're just holding on because they can. It's interesting, isn't it, that, you know, they don't want to start discounting on new stuff because then they have to discount everything and it's just sort of this, a waterfall effect. But yeah. um, the other thing too that you mentioned there that, that it I think Rouse Hill, Maguire's Hill, you said – was a month ago, what, 10 months worth of inventory. Now it's 11 months. Yes. So that means they've had a month's worth of inventory added mm. and what, no sales? Well, there's still sales, but they're not keeping up. So, you know, really mm. what you want to do is you want to, you want to see a, an increasing proportion of buyers relevant to, or re- relative to, to the amount of sellers. So, you know, you need to typically in any market, whether it be houses or something else, some other widget, you, you really need to see price as a mechanism um, to clear that stock. Well, yeah. Before, Kent, around the buyer versus the seller market, what's that watermark where on the inventory level where you believe that a prop that market turns, that switches? Is it eight months of inventory? Yeah, I'd say seven to eight months. Now, it depends on when you do it. Now, I just finished an analysis trying to look at what happens with prices and inventory levels. And typically what I found was equilibrium was around the six-month mark um, based on current data over the last 12 months. Um, and then what I found is once you go Sorry. seven months, eight months, nine months, for every month uh, above that count of, of seven, you found a price decrease of 1% for every month. So does that make sense? So and the yeah. other way around in terms of, you know, we're talking about, you know, it's not looking good for these sort of house and land packages. Armadale is an interesting one, which we haven't spoken about. But um, on the buy side, when, you know, they've only one month of stock on the market, which is in the beaches and yeah. et cetera, are those prices likely to be rising, oh, you know, yeah. really strongly? Yeah, absolutely. It's that same ratio. So typically, you know, for every month below the the magic marker six, you, you're seeing increases in prices. Now, all bets are off at the moment. This COVID world's a weird, yeah. weird world. But uh, so markets aren't behaving 
normally, but generally speaking, um, you know, you can't bargain too much when there's not not too much to choose from, and there's you know there's there's a lot of buyers out there for for that one 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 month of stock. So. Um, I think the difference is um, bargains can be had when there's a lot to choose from. What do you think is happening in the Armadale sort of patch? I mean, has that been a recent trend with COVID? I know there's a big university there that might have had an impact. I mean, do you know what's what's happened up there? Yeah, I haven't um, spoken to anyone up there. All I can really do is look at the data. It's been a fairly consistent rise. Um, so it hasn't, right. been, hasn't been a dramatic shift. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think a lot of these things creep up. You know, a lot of new builds, are, usually in the housing markets, it's new estate, mm. new estates that come up. But uh, uh, I, I can't answer you on that, actually, actually drilling down and looking at the why or what's happening um, in Armidale. I'm just looking at the snapshot of data in front of me. And we often forget that in regional areas, there's quite a lot of house, there's quite a lot of development at times, you know. Uh, I think I mentioned it in a recent episode. I was driving down the South Coast recently and, and I couldn't actually, I was a bit surprised, you know, looking at Shoalhaven and places like that, which I'm aware of a lot of house and land uh, subdivisions and new developments out there. But, you know, it just seemed to be more and more. And so, I mean, they're, they're quite close to Sydney. Armadale's a little bit further away. But I think a lot of these regional towns do have quite a lot of new develop, new development. Um <laughs> It's interesting too, Logan, I mean, we, in our Full of Forecaster episode and in the Full of Forecaster report, which is there to be downloaded from the website if anybody is interested, um, we talked about, uh, well, we actually did some research to look at what actually have has happened in, in Logan Shire in particular because 10 years ago, you know, there was so much being talked up about it and very a lot of unwitting investors particularly from southern states, went up there and bought these house and land packages. And I would yeah. imagine after 10 years when they've seen no price growth and in many cases they've lost money, um, not just uh, in opportunity costs but real money, um, you know, that there's there's – there's lots of evidence there of prices falling. And so I guess if they've got yeah. pressure for rents as well, they're going to start to to loading up, you know, the listings market with stock, right? Would that be one of the reasons? Well, look, I, I think what you're, you're saying is relevant. I, I yeah. don't hear a lot of people mention adjusting for CPI or adjusting for expenses. So if you, mm. if, if you have prices are, are flat, if, if they're flat in real terms, they're, they're still going backwards. Yes. That's too painful, Kent. A lot of, uh, you don't really want to do those numbers when you've, you know, bought a property and it hasn't gone up. You don't want to then hurt yourself even more by adding in opportunity costs and inflation <laughs> and other costs. Uh, you're 100% right with, with Logan, Veronica. I've, you know, seen lots and lots of clients with it in their portfolio and they've come and, you know, they've generally seen some property expert who's promised them, you know, that that uh, growth corridor between Gold Coast and Brisbane mm. is going to boom and there's going to be all this infrastructure and it's going to be, you know, amazing. Um and the reality is that a lot of these investors now, like, yes, they haven't had a price growth. Yes, they've lost money um, a lot of the case when you take into consideration costs and selling costs. But what you're showing here, Kent, um, and we aren't picking this data. This is, you know, the numbers do the talking, um, is that if they wanted to sell right now, well, then they're competing with 11 months of other stock on the market. So, you know, it's a race to the bottom, isn't it, really? If you really need to transact, well, You've got to offer a bit of a fire sale, don't you, to to get it off the market? Oh, look, I would say that it it, it depends on the market, uh, and yeah, back to that old elasticity thing that we learned in high school is that sometimes it's it, it might only be a modest adjustment in prices to attract enough buyers in to bring things back into balance. You know, so it, yeah, it depends on how scared the buyers are. Um, and it, you know, if they're easily spooked off, or you know, whether whether a five or a ten percent or a modest adjustment in prices is enough to bring them back in sufficient numbers, and that depends on the location. I guess just as a buyer, if you can, you know, uh, you go up there and you look on domain or real estate, and you've just got lots and lots of choice. You know, as a negotiation tactic, you're not going to be desperate, are you? You're not going to be like, if I don't get this one, I'm going to be devastated because, you know, there's lots of other things on the market. So you're going to come in with low ball offers and hopefully the market will come to you. Well, um, yeah, the savvy, and, the savvy buyers would know that, but there's still a lot of wood ducks out there. Yeah, and I think it's just uh, you've got to 
is you got to get a bit lucky to get one of those wood ducks, right? If you're selling, um, <laughs> and so you know when you own these properties, you got to basically bank on the the smart buyers only wanting your property rather than the wood ducks because. Uh, that's a bit of a luck of the draw, I guess. <laughs> so, Chris, that you were doing a little bit of research before, and you looked at uh, at Rouse Hill. You found one example that sort of could typify um, what some owners have been experiencing there. Do you want to share that? Yeah, I mean, I sometimes you know would like to go down to a property level and just you know as soon as you search a suburb, um, look at this, you know, go straight to domain real estate. You can see what's sold. It's very easy to start to figure out what's happening in a market and uh, property just literally sold, you know, last week, um, you know, they sold it for 900. They bought it five years ago um, for actually more than that um, and actually tried to sell it in 2017 for 960 and didn't get what they wanted. A property sat on the market for five months. So you can kind of see, yeah. uh, you know, that they've, that's a really painful experience. They've lost money over five years. Um, and they also went through a lot of pain a few years ago trying to sell it and just sitting on the market for months and months. And so they've decided obviously to pull the pin on it and just get rid of it last week. But that's a that's a painful kind of story there. And yeah. you know, we, this wasn't a cherry pick. It was just the first one that came up on real estate and threw it into RP data. And, you know, we've got a story there. And that's, that's I think, a really interesting thing for any property investor to do you start to look at prior sales and find out when did they buy it, what did they pay, you know, what's the story behind it. I like the the fact, Chris, that you you you're talking to it as you know, as, as they are real people, um, mm. yeah, feeling pain. Uh, I think a lot of these numbers gloss over that point. Absolutely, and look, I mean, even just a cursory look at what's on the market in in Armadale as well. I mean, you've got sort of you can always group the properties into four groups. You know, that you've got. Um, properties out of town on a bit of land. Yeah, you've got properties in town, which are often sort of an older style of property, you know, maybe a bit of charm and obviously walkability and all the rest of it. Then you've got the yeah. older subdivisions. They might be 30, 40 years old, and the houses are looking a bit tired. And um, and then you've got new stuff. You know, yep. new stuff that's just been completed. So all of that gets tipped into the pot and obviously makes it, dip. I would hazard that the properties that are probably suffering the most would be those um, more modern ones that are dated. I would guess out of those groups, as those those four groups, um, you know, that would be the harder properties to sell in Armadale at the moment. That's my guess. I think the other challenge too is you get governments come in with special grants and, and whatnot that uh, influence markets unduly. Um, mm. That's a big call out. That throws yeah. you out with a lot yeah. of new builds. Yes, yeah, so and we've got a lot to say about that. <laughs> hmm. Those yeah. those incentives are for the construction industry. They're not for first home buyers, you know. And and I think that that's what first home buyers sort of forget. They 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 think, oh, these are for me. They're not for you, you know. They're actually for you to help prop up an industry. And and as I said before, and I'll say it again, I'm conflicted because we want a good economy. Uh, construction industry is is very important to that. We've talked about the apartment, sorry, the houses. We've talked about in particular the dangers of house and land packages and areas in which there are lots of them and then obviously when you get markets under pressure, they tend to rise to the top or the bottom of the, the heap, however you want to look at that. Um, and obviously those, the three areas where we're seeing very low inventory and, and I guess we need to call, call the distinction here. We're not talking about, oh, the median prices in these areas is going up or down. We're talking about the, the underlying factor that will impact prices is going up or down, correct? Correct, yeah. correct. So, and and we'll, we'll talk to a, a, an example of where inventory is going up, but but uh, prices are also going up. So, it's, you know, there's some conflicts there that sometimes show up when relying on medians, uh, and that's often the result of what's stocked, what's listed. So, if you've got all new stock uh, on the market, prices can go up, but that doesn't yes. mean, doesn't mean your the value of your property is going up. So, no, that's a. Is that your anomaly for this month? It is. Uh, it is. Yeah, we'll, we'll come. If, we'll come to that. Yeah, we've got to do units first, don't we? We've got to do units. So, so this one's interesting. I think the unit market overall is fascinating because you've got you know, large volumes of concentrated stock in a given suburb by nature of it being a, a medium or high rise. So that's a given. A couple of other interest interesting statistics that pertain to units is that. So many of them convert to, to rentals. So the rental tenure 
is also often high. And I think that is making the unit market uh, extra vulnerable uh, in these COVID times. So I've got three um, uh, cold spots or cooling spots, three uh, warm or warming spots. The, uh, the first on the list is Whitsunday SA3. And that kind of mm-hmm. covers the broader area of Mackay and, and Isaac, I think you call it, and Whitsunday. So um, up there, we've, we've got you know, effectively more than two years of inventory. So it's, wow. um, it's, it's, it's really high. Um, and, and, you know, it's you know, jumped a lot in the last, you know, imagine probably potentially it's a lot of Airbnbs and investors are like, well, let's just get rid of it now. Yeah, you know, I, that's, a, that's, that's a, a, a been a biggie. That was a hot topic uh, in the news uh, a few months back, the high volumes. But I think, you know, obviously an area like uh, the Whit Sunday, massive impact of um, tourism. Yeah, you know, one of the biggest employers, if not the biggest employer, is tourism. So, I think a lot of that would be the result of um, tourism. Um, things have, you know, probably added another month of uh, inventory in the last four weeks alone in Whit Sunday. The um, the, the second area is here. You guessed it, Browse Hill, again. So for for units as well. So, you know, we're close to seventeen months of inventory um, in in Rouse Hill, um, McGrath Hill. Yeah. So there's been a lot of new builds that, you know, uh, and a lot of people in apartments that, you know, don't want them anymore and they're just on the market. So you're saying there's almost a year and a half of what would transact normally just sitting there kind of getting stale. Yeah. And, you know, it, I would have, argue, you could have easily argued, wow, this area is going to be so solid because of the transport and the rail links and whatnot. So that's still, those fundamentals are still there. This is just purely a supply and demand issue. But there's a massive oversupply Correct. on the market now, even if there was normal demand, um, which is probably lower right now, there's still a year and a half worth of stock on the market. So it's still like, why would buyers be desperate to buy it when there's so many choices out there? That's kind of the, well, the message we need well, to understand. Also, they'd be trapped. Think about it. You know, like you, you buy a property and then you've got to know if you've got your eyes open, yep. you've got to know that if you do need to sell for whatever reason and, and conditions don't change, then you are going to be facing 18 months to two years before you can sell your property. Well, that's the point. If I had six or 700K to spend on an apartment, where would I be looking? Definitely not there. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, and that's it you've got you've got choice now you've got you know whereas in, in, in when when inventory levels are low you don't have a lot of choice so with with the with sundays i mean Mackay, i mean that's that's certainly um mining is one of the industries up there right yeah. is is a lot of this construction we also got to remember the lag time between when you know from when properties are conceived or, or approved funded then built then hit the market and then uh, occupied etc 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 this is sort of the long continuum um you know were these built with fly in fly out in my i mean i don't know i mean do we do we know what led to all this construction in the first place um, no, I don't. I don't have that answer at my fingertips. Cannonvale's the suburb to look at. So if you're if you're mm. online and you've got yourself a little browser, um, pull up the suburb Cannonvale and have a look at that because I've got you know in excess of sixteen months of inventory there, and that that was my focal focus suburb. But have a look at what su- uh, what Cannonvale does. I think a lot of it must must be you know that sort of backpacker travellers um, lost their jobs. Um, you know, tourism has just died, and a lot of people would just think, "Well, I used to always go to Whit uh, Sundays on holidays. That's not likely to happen. Um, let's just, you know, financially we're in a bit of trouble. Let's just get rid of our investment property up there." So, what do you do? Take up which yacht do you take up, Chris? <laughs> Don't ever buy a boat. That's the best advice. <laughs> and you think this stuff is cheap too? I'm li- literally looking at it at the moment. You've got apartments starting at 159,000. Yeah. I can see. You know, there's a really nice one here, and, and you know, you look at it with your Sydney lens, and that's the scary thing. Uh, 275,000 negotiable. It's two bedroom, two bathroom. It's got lovely views over the ocean of the Whit Sundays. Um, you know, I guess over the years when people have been looking up there and feeling positive about just generally the economy, they're, they're thinking, that's a bargain. I'm going to go and hold it out there all the time. Well, like, you know, that, that could be the, the call out here is are they weekenders? Yeah. 
Yeah, that could be as well. What about the third one? You said that's off. So we got um, Toowoomba. You know, Whitstone days. We've got Rouse Hill. Okay, Toowoomba. Toowoomba. Yeah, Toowoomba units. So that's um, heading towards that 12 months of inventory level. So Toowoomba, from, that's in uh, not on the coast, right? No, it's no, in that's inland. inland. It's, ma- it's so massive. You think, you think inland as well. That you're not really running out of land because you can go north, south, east and west. So you think the unit market wouldn't be the strongest in somewhere like Toowoomba because people can still get houses. But, you know, it well, sounds like... That was my, my, my hard lesson first property I bought was down south of Brisbane and there was just land everywhere and I bought a townhome that just I had no idea, right? And, you know, as soon as the market started to get hot, another, you know, they, they'd buy another knockdown and build another 10, 10 townhomes. Yeah. You know, so yeah. the market could never really get a run on. Because as soon as it started to get warm, supply just ramp up. Well, it is the thing, isn't it? When, when land is relatively cheap compared to capital city prices, uh, normally you don't see apartments. <laughs> you know, you, you see houses being built. Um, but I think too there was a lot of noise a few years back. There wasn't there a new airport being built in Toowoomba, and there, you know, I heard a lot of spookers banging on about how airports, you know, bring property prices, bring people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> Um, maybe when it's been built, I think it's one of your favourite yeah. lines, isn't it, Chris? You know, what happens when it's been when it's finished? Yeah, yeah, a lot of jobs to build it, but you know, especially in the new technological COVID world, there'll be less and less people working at the airports. Um, yes, so, so that's a cold side. I mean, I think the reality is we've, you've got to be extremely uh, concerned with supply anyway. Whenever you buy units, it's the one risk you've really got to focus on even more so than houses. But, um, you know, then you need to just worry about if you are going to sell, you've got to be obviously really concerned about how much supply is going to be on the market when you sell. And this is what this is alluding to. So what about the hotspots? Well, the hotspots, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, a, a few suburbs in there. Um, uh, Byron Bay will, will show up uh, here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I never thought of Byron Bay uh, as, a, as a, a unit market at all. Um, but uh, it, it's showing up the region that it belongs to is called Richmond Valley Coastal. Um, so that's up there. That's uh, 1.69, one, less than two months of inventory. Uh, the other one that's in there is Bayswater Bassendine, which is in the Perth, uh, northeast pocket of Perth. So, you know, poor old uh, WA has been you know, bearing the brunt of a lot of yeah. negative stories for a long time. There's a, there's a positive out of, um, out of Perth. Um, and the third one in that list is is the SA3 of Manly. Um, and again, those nor- the northern beaches is just just rocketing. We, we really noticed the northern beaches um, just going crazy uh, late last year it would be. Um, certainly it was one of the areas, uh, you know, we had a few searches going on. It was one of the areas that I think responded really quickly following the election maybe it was because tony abbott was no longer their um their member um it was it was quite phenomenal it was it was like bang and all of a sudden you just you, prices were rising all of a sudden competition was just really furious and uh it was it was quite amazing i mean obviously and where we were looking more sort of for family homes not so much manly as a suburb um, but manly is quite unique in terms of the unit market in that um you know it's a long way from the cbd if you are driving obviously you've got beaches which is really appealing but for anybody who buys an apartment that's walking distance to the ferry that's a, that's got scarcity all over it yeah well the, the the one that i'm interested in is uh, look, we all love byron bay but the, the the price that you would look for a property up there i mean the median Asking price or listing price for an apartment up in Byron is is seven hundred and seventy thousand. So that means that half of the properties you're going to be finding up there uh, listings for for apartments are going to be above that mark. So mm. very expensive. And to consider that it's yeah you know, Byron Bay specifically, it's it's below three months of inventory. So it's a very high demand area. And I, I can't help but think that the unit market's been driven by the fact that people can't afford houses up there. Maybe. I mean, it's funny because I know Byron itself um, tends to sort of follow Sydney prices in many ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, you do get a lot of um, escapees from Sydney going up there. (laughs) Um, 
so you've got sort of people going there to live, people going there to rent their properties out. There's also been a real furor of the Airbnb market up in Byron. It's not a very popular thing at all up there. Um, you've also got proximity to two airports. You know, you've got Ballina and Gold Coast, and not that many people are using them at the moment, but um, in many ways it makes it a very accessible place for people who are looking to um, have a, a partial semi sea change mm. um, yeah. because they can still work and they, you know what I mean? So there's, there's actually a lot of very unique factors about that area apart from the, the beautiful landscape and beaches. Now, there's not a lot of apartments in Balgala, no. are there? And that's, and probably, that's probably why. The average amount of listings is about eight, uh, you know, at any given day if you went to try and buy mm. one, you'd, you'd only find about eight listings. And this is this is key to it, though, isn't it? Certainly in Byron Bay, same deal. There are there are quite a lot of holiday apartments, um, but you know, if you look at Balgala, there's not a huge, massive new development. You know, I think the signs are there, aren't they? Anywhere that's had a lot of new development or recent development is under a lot of pressure. Anywhere that's hasn't had the ability or the land available for those new yeah. developments is holding up very very well i think so and you've also got the old art deco style that you know it's common through the ramwicks and the coogees in the eastern suburbs but also balgala seem to have have a lot of these mm. beautiful old art deco style so you know yeah. if, you, if you were to look at that as a sub market group you, you you wouldn't classify that in the same league as a high rise and, let's yeah, and i love it. i love this just talking about this and this is why we're keen to do this and a bit of a deep dive every month about what's happening because the media will love to and even you know people who come to me or i speak to they'll say oh is it a buyer's market or is it a seller market it's going to easily quickly flip from a buyer's to a seller's market and i kind of always kind of go a bit deeper and say well what are you actually trying to buy where are you trying to buy etc and that could be a seller's or a buyer's market it's completely different to what the you know they thought initially so I think it's really important for our listeners to, to kind of keep going deeper with the data uh, and focus on what you're trying to buy and what, what's actually happening in that market. So if you're trying to buy an apartment in the, you know Manly or Byron Bay, it's going to be tough, right? It's, there's not much on the market and there's more likely to be more demand than supply. Mm. So the, the thing too, you know, I'm looking at uh, Bassendine, for instance, and in WA, in Perth, the thing is that with apartments, you've got to remember this data incorporates apartments, townhouses and villa units. Yes. So there's there's quite a lot of diversity in the stock that's captured in, in the unit data. And so when you look at some of these areas like in Bassendine, then you know, I just quickly looked up um, uh, units, apartments and units for sale. I've got nine results yeah. and most of those nine are actually villa units. Mm. So they are single level, um, you know, attached strata units and they look like little houses really. And so retirement, they're great for retirees. They're great for first home buyers. You know what I mean? So they're actually, it's, uh, and I know we've spoken with Jared uh, McKay, um, he's a Victorian, a Melbourne uh, buyer's agent in the past around villa units and their, and their popularity in Melbourne, you yeah. know, because they do have this multi-buyer uh, appeal and, you know, so I guess that's, you've got to look at the type of stock that forms the unit stock and you've also got to look at the amount of it that exists. And I would suggest that whilst mm. it stays low, then these areas are great. But if there's potential to build lots of units and it's zoning that allows for lots of high rise, then you could be in trouble. Yeah, I was talking to um, a, a JL, one of my JLL friends down in South Australia was saying, Townhomes in 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 and around Adelaide behave very differently than they do in the other states, and they're more aligned. His view, they're more aligned to housing markets. Mm, mm. And it's really difficult to to actually cut through that if you are looking at data because you do have to have that local knowledge, right? Yeah. Now, how about we talk about your anomaly, Kent? And because my, every month we're going to discuss something that doesn't fit the pattern. What's July's anomaly? Yeah, my anomaly is the suburb of Bowen Hills, the market, unit market. So in Bowen Hills, what I found is inventory level building, but the price has gone up. So that's a bit of a problem. So the median price has jumped by 4%. So if I were, were one of these... Uh, magazines or publications that would do a hot spotting list or top growth area, I'd probably feature Bowen Hills. But in reality, uh, it's an anomaly. Um, inventory levels are building. 
So it's a, it's more a reflection of um, the stock that's listed for sale. Inventory level is currently over 12 months. So prices are not going up. Values are not going up um, in an area with 13 months of stock. So that's Bowen Hills in Queensland near Brisbane, Brisbane yeah. CBD. Yeah. So, you know, what's causing that, Ken? Obviously, I think we know, but, you know, explaining to our listeners. Yeah, well, typically you've got, uh, at the moment I'm counting just over, well, nearly 80 listings at the moment on average. So about 78 listings. Um, and then you look at, well, how many properties are selling uh, on average? Uh, and when I look at that, there's around six, give or take, six properties selling per month. Wow. So, you know, that tells me that the inventory levels are you know, significantly higher than, than 12 months. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a conflict in the data saying that uh, prices are going up if you use median prices as your guide. So the asking prices, the, the average listing price has been going up, but that's a reflection of what's listed for sale. Yeah. Wow. So if you're trying to sell an apartment, is you're competing with 80 other apartments on the market and last month only six people bought or averaging generally is only six people buying every month. Yeah. So you've just got to, you know, and that's, that's the thing, isn't it? You've got, if that, how is your property going to be scarce when there's 80 of them and there's only six buyers, you that's know, it. and that's kind of the real thing that I think we've got to keep drumming down because I think a lot of people still don't get the kind of dynamics of supply and demand and why you've really got to be careful buying anything that you can have supply issues with. I think also what's what's alarming there is that that's a statistic that is real, i.e. prices rising. However, when you dig down, like you say, you've got to dig deeper because then that explains that it's, it's they're not really rising. It's just that you've got newer stock and that sells at a higher mm, price. True. But then that data then gets often misused by spruikers who say, look at the prices rising in this area and people who are not savvy enough or, or understand enough of really what's going on who aren't able to critically analyze that data to say actually <laughs> i'm not buying one of those because then i'm just contributing to prices going up but um, that also includes media there's a lot of media types yes. that jump in on that mm. and- which is why we're doing this podcast <laughs> <laughs> okay and on the rental side of things What's been happening, Kent? Yeah, so I've, um, I've jumped straight into some suburbs uh, on the on the rent, rental side. So I've got um, three cold suburbs or cooling suburbs um, and three warming suburbs. Um, the cooling suburbs are calculated based on the volume, the count of listings that are older than three weeks. So the number of rental listings over 21 days old. Um, we've got South Brisbane. Um, that's got over 300 listings that are now three weeks old. We've got St Kilda. Um, I've included St Kilda um, for a reason. It's starting to repair a little bit. So there's a month on month, Mm. that that count is starting to reduce. But what's of interest in St Kilda in the housing market, this is so at a a broad level, it's not not a massive housing market, but prices are starting to change there. And what's interesting here is I'm finding a lot of, well, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of landlords are holding on to the lease price that they were getting last year and not appreciating the market conditions and adjusting fast enough. So the reason why I picked out St Kilda is it looks like the landlords might be a little bit more savvy and and making those adjustments. Um, right. And, and the third one in the list is Strathfield, the suburb of Strathfield. A lot of, a lot of properties there. Um, and we've got, yeah, 200 listings that are older than 21 days there. And do you have that? So they're, they're, the, um, they're the three cooling spots. Um, I'll talk about the three warming spots. So um, I've selected these based on overall that their region, the SA3 region's doing quite well um, in terms of the uh, overall number of listings older than 21 days, but also the trend line. So we've got Penrith. Um, we've got a suburb called Kerwin up in the Townsville SA3. And the last suburb is a lovely suburb called New Lambton up in the Newcastle SA3. <laughs> is that one going to come number one every month? I, uh, I'm going to find a way to showcase New Lambton every month. <laughs> I, I just have to step in here because let's face it, New Lambton, that's your area. Um, are you Warringah, Chris? Oh, no, you're Pitwater, aren't you? Uh, well, yeah, the 
beaches, nah, I guess, up no. on the beaches. So people, people what no, I yeah. you miss out. No, nah, no, nah, miss out. I was just trying to think that if the three of us were so clever, because because I'm in that uh, that um, Marrickville slash Petersham area. I think I'm in that that SA three. Yep. I was just going to basically say how clever the three of us are to actually all have property in these hot areas <laughs> except for the fact chris that you're in pitwater not in warringah <laughs> we'll anyway <laughs> back back to okay so you so you, you you're beating your chest over new lambton you're saying that rentals are um they've got low vacancy rates in yep. those three areas very interesting penrith Kerwin, townsville and new lambton and given that townsville is one of our our areas for pr- downward pressure on unit prices because of the inventory on the stock, that's sort of interesting to see that one little suburb's doing all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think too we're going to look at some of the the, the jobs, and I, I, I understand my local market. One of the biggest employers, the, the medical industry, We've got a big hospital here. So that, mm. that's one sector that's growing um, significantly. Mm. So I think that's the big driver of that, and that that points to what we'll cover in the magazine next month, which is looking at the. Um, the unemployment data and then breaking that down by sector. And we'll be definitely covering that in our August report with you. Okay, so and also just before we sort of finish up on this rental thing, what would you say these rental data, this rental data, this vacancy rate data is a leading indicator of? Uh, look, there's a, there's a couple of things here. The first leading indicator is that it will lead to a, a reduction in, in rental prices because people have choice. Um, so people are effectively exiting um, uh, properties that they would consider they're paying too much for and going and doing a deal and you know, jumping ship and finding another property to rent. Um, mm-hmm. So that's happening at scale. Um, I think the, the second thing that we uh, are likely to see is uh, landlords post that September cliff um, that may decide that they've had enough and they list their prop, their current rental property uh, gets listed for sale. Um, well, I saw on the news today that uh, the federal government is putting a lot of pressure on the banks to extend that uh, that uh, the grace periods. So that might get pushed out a little bit. But that's just a can that's been kicked down mm, the road, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, at, at some point in time, um, those government subsidy, subsidies end um, and the question is, well, when and in what markets uh, do they have the greatest impact? Yeah, yep. I think with the rental side, it's really imp- you made a great point there, Kent, around uh, the investor that can't rent the property out because there's lots and lots of properties for rent and lots of choice. Um, you know, generally, if it's a good property, you just drop your rent and you always find a tenant. But when there's so much supply out there, like even that might not even be an option for these investors just to offer a bargain rent. Um, and at some point in time, it, you know, they get they lose patience, the pain becomes too much and, you know, they'll, they'll throw it on the market to sell. The problem is that goes back to what we discussed very early on in the podcast yep. was around the listing numbers of sales. And that's no better either. Well, you, know, because- yeah, you could be in a double whammy sub, uh, suburb, which is mm. you know, something we can cover in, in, in next month. But, uh, you know, if you're in a market that's got a low uh, inventory in terms of properties for sale, um, then that's not going to be as painful. Um, you might yeah. do okay. Um, but there's a lot of suburbs, especially around the inner city areas, where you, you, you've got the double whammy, very, very high inventory levels and now extremely high vacancy rates. Time to face the music for some investors, which is not very pleasant, I have to say. No. Okay, well, this has been a great snapshot and we're very much looking forward to coming back with next month's report. Chris, what would you say has been your greatest takeaway from this discussion? I think I've been dying to break down the data and, you know, really help our listeners kind of understand, you know, around Australia and in, even in our capital cities, where are the danger zones and, you know, what's actually happening on the ground and comparing that to some suburbs that are doing really well. I think this data over time will be a really great education tool for people to really get a good grasp of the micro markets within the cities. You know, for me, it's been, you know, just that not using median price, you know, we've, we've and, and I found myself, funnily enough, it, it's habitual, sort of wanting to lean towards thinking, oh, 
you know, we're talking about price data here, but we're not. And and I'm, I'm loving that. And I, as I said, even myself trying to retrain my my thinking and the way in which we have this conversation. And but it's so important to get to the underlying fundamentals. And so I'm I'm quite excited about you know building on this. How about Kent? What's the lasting thing for you? Well, look, the takeaway for me is before we do next month, make sure that I go in and look at these suburbs online. Um, so you know, I think I got caught short on a couple of suburbs there. So next month, lesson learned is make sure I go and look at a lot of these listings and spend a little bit more time uh, eyeballing properties um, before next month. Well, me too, to be honest, and probably Chris. You know, I think that what we will all do is jump in and have a have a quick um, look. I mean, I have to say, when I travelled the country buying property, uh, various different locations. Um, different types of property, different market conditions, all, all sorts of things. And I suddenly got thrown into new suburbs and had to um, quickly upskill. And, I, and you know, this is actually bringing back a, that skill for me. I haven't done this for a long time and it's fascinating. It's like, you know, what are the dynamics? What actually is, is, is impacting on this market? So we're going to, as, as Kent said, and thanks for that, Kent, we're going to bring more of that uh, in coming episodes. As I said, this is going to be a monthly thing as an addition to our normal elephant podcasts. So thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your questions and feedback. Connect with us via the website or email us at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. Please join us for our next episode. We interview demographer, social researcher and futurist Mark McCrindle. We want to understand whether there's an urban relocation process going on in Australia, whether there's going to be a permanent shift of people, particularly millennials, away from the big cities to the regions, what that's going to do to property prices and also how we're starting to get a bit more hopeful even though we're all learning to deal with continuous volatility. Join us and find out. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.